Hey y'all, it's Kate and welcome to episode 8 of the Texas Missing Podcast, part 2 of Elisa Roberson's story. So I wanted to give a quick thank you to our new supporters, both on social media and on our podcast platforms. Not only do I appreciate you guys sharing the episodes, but also in taking time to give us constructive feedback. I know that we're fairly new, but I want to strive in making each episode better, and when I receive tips and suggestions, that truly does help in improving the show. But as I mentioned, this is part two of Elisa Roberson's story, so if you haven't already, leave me right here and go back and listen to episode seven so you can get caught up. Now, where I left off in episode seven, I mentioned that a person of interest in Elisa's case had been arrested in Sinton, Texas which is about 30 minutes from Aranza's pass. Well, since that episode, Ruby and I were able to figure out that the arresting agency was actually Aranza's pass PD, but I will go more in depth with that later on in the episode. So in all of our source material, the only person ever mentioned as a possible suspect was Marina's ex-boyfriend, Ralph Gonzalez, and he was never publicly named. But there was also another major person of interest that has been confirmed by previous detectives for Aranza's past PD who were working the case, as well as family of Elisa. That person was Bob Green, Debbie Green's father. And if y'all don't remember, Debbie Green is the friend that Elisa left her home to meet when she went missing. So when Ruby told me this, I was a bit surprised. But my mind immediately went to Ruby's account of events the night Elisa went missing. When Debbie, her father, and another of Debbie's friends had arrived at Elisa's house after searching for her. And they all had ice cream cones, and they even had brought an ice cream cone for Elisa. As we discussed in part one, Ruby had explained that even back then as a child, how weird she felt about that incident. And how out of place it was, and I couldn't agree more, but it's, it's just kind of one of those things that you can't put your finger on, but you know it was just odd. It's unclear when exactly Bob Green became a person of interest, but something incredibly strange occurred after Elisa disappeared. Ruby explained to me that initially when Elisa went missing, Debbie's mother Terry had come over to their house and told Marina that she thought Bob had taken Elisa and went on to say that he had been acting suspicious and even disappeared for a couple of hours the same day Elisa disappeared. And when he returned, he told his wife he had fallen asleep in his vehicle at his workshop. Also, keep in mind, it was the beginning of August in Texas, so the temperatures were fairly high, so falling asleep in your car doesn't really seem very legitimate. Now, Ruby and her mother thought this revelation was bizarre, and they had a hard time wrapping their heads around it, as they were all family friends, and Bob was always coming over and helping her mother and taking the kids out for ice cream. Ruby said she would often spend the night at their house, and Bob was always so nice, so they just didn't picture him doing anything like that. Ruby notes that her mother does not remember the exact conversation with police reference Bob, but she does remember that one of the detectives telling her that Bob was in fact a person of interest in the case. Lieutenant Linda Thompson confirmed that all the properties that Bob owned were searched in 1989, the year that Elisa disappeared, but no evidence was found. Bob remained on Linda's radar, and to this day, she believes that he may have had something to do with Elisa's disappearance. Now, even though Bob was just a person of interest in Elisa's disappearance, he still found himself in hot water. Now, in part one... I discussed a person of interest being convicted of a very specific crime. Well, in 1992, Bob was convicted of indecency with a child. The original charge filed was actually aggravated sexual assault of a child, but it was pled down to indecency as the victim was supposedly safe and away from Bob. 
Bob received six years of probation for the conviction, and as I said previously, the case was filed by Aransas Pass PD Lieutenant Linda Thompson. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about the victim, but I do think it's important to note that the victim was within Bob's family. But what's interesting is Ruby has filed a records request to obtain this arrest report, and Aransas Pass PD has told her that they do not have any arrests or report records for Bob. So although we do not have the arrest report, I was able to obtain the court records for the offense, and it's the judgment document that outlines on February 10th of 1992, Robert Green pled no contest to the charge of indecency with a child. Now, pleading no contest essentially means that Bob Green neither admitted guilt or innocence of the crime, but it's still a conviction. So think of it as he's not saying he did it, but he's also not saying that he didn't do it. With the plea, Bob received six years of probation, and some of the notable conditions of his probation included avoid injurious or vicious habits, and abstain from the use of controlled substances or dangerous drugs in any form. Report in person to the probation officer of San Patricio County, Texas, once each month between the first and tenth days of the month beginning February 10th, 1992. Not leave the state of Texas without the written consent of this court filed among the papers of the cause, Report immediately any change of address, change of job, or arrest to the probation officer. Participate in outpatient sex offender group treatment program sponsored by the Sex Offender Services. Submit to a polygraph examination concerning your personal sexual conduct once each three months during the term of probation. Abstain from consumption of alcohol in any form during the term of probation must not enter any bar, tavern, lounge, or other similar place. During the term of probation, not accompany any person under the age of 18 years without the presence of the minor's parent or parents. And finally, during the term of probation, not associate with, have contact with, or communicate with the victim or victims in this cause. So I'm not sure if you guys noticed but none of these conditions included registering as a sex offender. The sex offender registry laws in Texas went into effect on September 1st of 1991, which was four days before Bob was arrested for the initial crime, which was on September 5th of 1991. But based on the Texas Department of Public Safety, offenders were not forced to register at that time. Now, Some of Bob's family has refuted this conviction, stating the victim recanted, but the DPS conviction records note they were updated on May 11th of 2023, and when I requested documents from San Patricio County District Court, there were no documents received noting that the conviction was overturned. Ruby and I did have an in-depth conversation about the conviction, She opened up about how it made sense with Bob's behavior, and looking back, it felt like it was more of grooming behavior, especially him coming over to their house and helping her mother and taking them to get food and on trips. She even said when he would drive them anywhere, he would have them sit on his lap, and her thinking back on it now, it just just makes her sick. So, because Debbie's house was so close to Elisa's, coupled with coming across Bob's criminal history, it brought up a question from me regarding some of the news articles that I read where Elisa had possibly told her mom that it felt like someone was following her or watching her. And Ruby did confirm that Elisa did tell her mom that while she was walking at home a couple times, she felt like someone had been watching her. But... Elisa never really expounded on this, and it was just kind of chalked up to her being a kid. Now, although Bob was convicted, within a couple years of 1992, I wasn't able to find the exact year, Bob and his family moved back to Iowa, where he originally was from, and there was never enough evidence to bring charges formally against him for Elisa's disappearance. 
One thing that I searched for but could never find was how Bob was able to move back to Iowa while being on probation for his conviction. There was a condition of his probation that I stated earlier where he would have to receive permission to move states, so that very well could have been the reason he was able to leave Texas. Now, throughout the next few years, even after Lt. Thompson left the department, Elisa's case was still being investigated. Several tips had come in from various states, but all were found to be dead ends. Ruby has kept in contact with the Randis PD as well and has given any information she can to the new detectives over the case, which would be Detective Rhodes, who oversees the Criminal Investigations Division as of 2021. Ruby went on to say she doesn't believe that her concerns have been taken seriously by the new detectives. She understands that Elisa's case is older, but that doesn't mean she should be dismissed or pushed aside. The next updates to Elisa's case would not come until 2016, but along with these updates came a lot of tension. According to source material, Detective Rhodes and Texas Equisearch conducted a search of Elisa's house in 2016. Detective Rhodes states, There used to be an open carport there, and it had since been walled in and taken into part of the house. We thought that maybe the slab that had been poured in there may be covering something up. The article went on to say that two other areas were searched that included a grassy area on another street and Debbie's house, but no evidence was found at any of the sites. I asked Ruby about the search at their old house and about the slab that they were talking about, and she told me that the slab that the detective mentions was poured many years after they moved so she was very confused why they chose to search the area. The detective stated he felt the slab was used to maybe cover something, but that wouldn't really make sense if they weren't even living there when the slab was originally poured. An article published by K33TV South Texas mentions the search, but also includes the statement, Elisa's sister Ruby told 3 News that her family signed off on the search of the house. Ruby said that the statement is incorrect and believes the news station confused her with the actual owners of the home, and she never signed off on any search. Another question I posed was whether the search was probable cause or consent. But with the probable cause, Aranda's past PD would have needed reasonable grounds to suspect that a crime did take place at the location, or the location contains possible specific items connected with the crime. The question is, if they did have PC, what was it? The owners of the home have stated, though, that nothing was found during the search. Something else I found interesting in another of the press articles is that Elisa's brother Tony was actually a person of interest in the case. And Detective Rhodes states specifically, There was a person of interest that I really wanted to speak with. That was a brother of Elisa, but he was in prison in Alaska and he committed suicide, so that is an area I can't explore right now. I missed that opportunity. I asked Ruby more about this, to which she stated that at the time of Elisa's disappearance, Tony was only 10, and he did have some mental health issues, but none of them made him aggressive, and he would never hurt his sisters. Ruby said there's never been one time that she thought that Tony had anything to do with Elisa's disappearance, and felt that he was only a person of interest due to Debbie's family spreading rumors and retaliation in regards to Bob being a person of interest. But we will touch more on this in a few minutes. So the searches are not the only thing that happened in the case in 2016. Ruby also explained that her and her mother went down to Aranda's past to speak with detectives. Ruby thought that it was just going to be a conversation regarding any updates in the searches, but the detectives ended up asking her mother to do another polygraph test. Now keep in mind, Marina passed a polygraph test during the initial investigation in 1989. Marina did say yes, as Ruby said, she has always done anything to help find Elisa. During the polygraph, Ruby stayed outside and a short time later was approached by an officer who stated to her that her mother had failed the polygraph test. The officer went on to tell her, that she must be suppressing the memories and that she holds the key to finding her sister. 
Ruby said she was taken back and continuously stated she did not know anything about what happened to her sister and that her mother is not responsible for her disappearance. Subsequently, Marina was told the same thing, that she failed the polygraph and that she needed to tell the truth. Marina maintained that she was innocent and had nothing to do with Elisa's disappearance. Ruby said that they were allowed to leave and to this day have never heard anything about the polygraph again. Ruby has attempted to get the polygraph results for the last few years, but has been refused. Ruby calls the police department at least once a year on the anniversary of Elisa's disappearance to see if there are any updates, but she feels less than welcome and almost a burden. Ruby, along with her PI, Richard Norgard, who has been assisting the family for years, have sent at least 10 records requests to Aranda's PD, with seven of those being for individuals. Only three have been provided by the department, and those were just recently received as Ruby has had to challenge the department to fill the request. The PD has told Ruby that some of the records cannot be obtained as they are tied to the investigation, but several of the requests have not been directly related to Elisa's investigation, reference specific subject arrests at the department. For instance, Ruby requested previous arrest records for Ralph Gonzalez, and she was only just now sent one singular report for domestic violence that was against her mother, to which the reporting officer didn't even have the decency to document her name and instead referred to Marina as wife. I asked Ruby how often the police were called out to their residence, and she told me several, for beating her mother bloody, for hurting her and her siblings in every way imaginable. Ruby recalled a time when her mother attempted to flee Ralph and ran to a friend's house. Ralph found her, drug her out by her hair, and took her home to continue beating her. Ruby has a difficult time understanding how after so many years of hell, there was only one police report filed, only one arrest. And as we spoke of earlier, Ruby submitted a request for Bob Green's arrest as well and was told by Aranda's past PD that Bob had never been arrested there, which is false as the indecency with the child arrest occurred in Aranda's past as it was Lieutenant Thompson's case. Ruby has even requested for other agencies to investigate Elisa's case with the idea that perhaps fresh eyes can bring in new leads, but Ruby has been met with a brick wall. It's been nearly eight years since the last public update. If the case hasn't had movement in that long, what's the harm in having other agencies look at the case? The Texas Rangers helped with the initial investigation. Would it be so far-fetched that they take another look? Of course, there may be things that as the public we aren't privy to. Perhaps there have been updates that just have not been pushed publicly. Regardless, Ruby just simply hopes that the department is still working to solve her sister's case. Unfortunately, along with the tension between the family and Aranda's past PD, Ruby has also been dealing with personal attacks from someone that was very much a part of this case, Debbie Green. Throughout the last few years, Debbie has been outspoken about the fact that she believes her father was wrongfully accused and blames Ruby and her family for Elisa's disappearance. Now, I went back and forth on how I wanted to talk about this, and if I wanted to contact Debbie and get her statements regarding the case, but I ultimately decided against it, as I have a difficult time understanding how a person can get on a social media platform, in an open forum, and spread vile theories, and blatantly lie regarding details of Elisa's case, all under Elisa's missing person poster. Just to turn around the next day and ask for forgiveness from the family and suggest they work together to solve Elisa's case. The same cycle has continued for the last few years. But on the contrary, if you would like to listen to Debbie tell her story, Gone Cold, Texas True Crime Podcast conducts an incredible interview in their five-part series covering Elisa's disappearance. The podcast host, Vincent, was gracious and respectful, but at the same time covered the important aspects that needed to be highlighted. With all the struggles faced in the last 34 years, Ruby, more than anything, just wants to be heard and her sister's case to be solved 
and she hopes by getting her case out into the open, it can maybe trigger a memory for someone and lead to ultimately finding peace for Elisa and her family. As of this August, Elisa will have been missing for 35 years. As always, I will post photos of Elisa as well as some others on our social media platforms at The Texas Missing. I would also like to invite anyone to join the Missing Elisa Roberson Facebook page, which is a discussion group about Elisa's case with updated case information. I'll link the page on our social media pages. If you have any information about the disappearance of Elisa Roberson, please contact the Tri-County Crime Stoppers at 800-254-8477. And with that, I'm Kate. And this is the Texas Missing Podcast.